It's now time for member statements. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much. Today it's my pleasure to honour the 2014 Alec Monroe Writers and Readers Festival that took place in North Huron. The festival was a huge success with over 250 guests visiting Huron Bruce throughout the weekend. The festival encourages fresh, fresh budding writers and <laughs> celebrates storytelling and reading throughout Huron Bruce, the riding and the world. As I have mentioned in the house before, Alice Monroe is from my hometown, Wingham, Ontario, and she also lived in Clinton. The festival hosted a number of events during in different locations throughout the weekend in North Huron, culminating at a gala event at the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 180 in Wingham. The gala saw five of the nine finalists read their short story competition entries. The festival had finalists from England, PEI, South Korea, New York, and across Ontario. I would like to actually congratulate specifically Lizzie McDonald, who is from the town of Godreach, Canada's prettiest little town, for placing third in the youth division. It is exciting to see the interest and support that this unique festival brings to North Huron. Alice Munro is a true Canadian great. She was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for the literature. I'll repeat that. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for literature and was declared a master of contemporary short stories. Alice Munro is one of only 13 women worldwide to receive this prestigious award. It is a true honour to stand here today to acknowledge her and the festival participants, and I congratulate the local committee for coordinating such a wonderful festival. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. On Friday, the people of Windsor and Essex County were disappointed to learn that the much-anticipated investment to build Ford's global engines would be going to Mexico rather than to Windsor. The Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure stated that his government will not invest tax dollars in any partnership that doesn't provide a strong return for Ontarians. Yesterday, the Deputy Premier stood before this House and stated that the government will continue to make investments in the automotive sector where they make sense. Ford's multi-billion dollar investment had the potential to create a thousand new jobs and solidify Ford's long-term presence in Windsor. Hundreds of laid-off Ford employees would be called back to work. When the government decided that this automotive investment didn't make sense, clearly they didn't consider the potential for spin-off jobs. Wages in our automotive sector allow employees to start and support families. The big three automakers often employ local students as part-time employees, allowing them to significantly reduce their student debt while gaining valuable career experience. Windsor's workforce is highly skilled and second to none in terms of productivity and safety. That is why companies consider investing in Windsor. We count on government to table competitive packages to secure these investments. This is not the last time we will compete with other jurisdictions for automotive investment, and we need this government to understand how important it is to capitalize on these opportunities. Hopefully, the next time this government is called to the table, they will understand that automotive investment in Windsor not only provides a strong return for Ontarians, it also makes complete sense. Thank you. The member, statements. The member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to begin uh, by thanking my colleagues who covered my house duty last week so I could return to Ottawa early on Wednesday. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week we were all shaken by the terrible loss of Corporal uh, Nathan Cirillo and Warrant Officer uh, Patrice Vincent. We were shaken by the attack on our parliament and the prospect in, of violence uh, in our peaceful and safe city of Ottawa. We all learned of the bravery of the, the Sergeant at Arms, the House of Commons Guards, and many of our first responders. Mr. Speaker, I was most moved by the bravery of a group of people who rushed towards danger to provide care and to comfort Corporal Cirillo. This was truly a selfless act. Mr. Speaker, last week I was moved by the outpouring of support of, at the Cenotaph and the long lineups to sign the Book of Condolences at City Hall. In our churches, our mosques, our synagogues, and our temples, we all came together to pray for Corporal Cirillo and, uh, and uh, Warrant Officer Patrice Vincent and their families, and for those all, all those affected by the, viol the violence that we witnessed last week. In Ottawa, we are one, and together we are strong. I have always been proud of the diverse and beautiful welcome welcoming city that is my home. Last week reminded me that it is Ottawa's people, all of us together, that make it such a wonderful place. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. Thank you. Member statements. 
Members, oh, uh, the member from Bruce Gray owns Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise today in support of the Multiple Sclerosis Society's Day at Queen's Park. Today, volunteers from the MS Society of Canada at Queen's Park meeting with MPPs from each political party to raise awareness about the needs of people living with multiple sclerosis and to bring us the perspectives and suggestions from the people affected by MS, the caregivers, the staff, and all the volunteers. I want to thank all members who are meeting today with MS Society representatives and wearing a carnation today in support of their good fight. One of the things that I've always believed about the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada is that it is a great organization, and as a great organization, it attracts great people. This is true of Michael Roche, who is in his 12th year as a volunteer in the Durham region, as well as Ontario Nunavut Division Manager of Government Relations, Donna Zukar, Board Chair Marie Vallant, GTA Regional Director Andrea Strath, and every MS advocate present here today. It's hard to hear that every day, nearly three people in Canada learn that they have MS. It's hard to imagine that there are 100,000 Canadians, our friends and neighbours, living with MS and going through their day, doing the same things we are, but which we take for granted, while battling at all times this disabling disease. It's hard to imagine that three times as many women are diagnosed with this disease as men. But we're proud of the work our health researchers are leading, continuously seeking to learn more about the disease and to develop new therapies. I have no doubt that one day we will find a cure for MS. And that's also why I believe it's so vital for us to be involved, to keep the dialogue going until that day when we M end MS. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member statements. The member from Windsor to comes. Thank you, Speaker. As you know, while well, some of us are doing okay in Ontario and a few are doing really, really well, Many of our friends and neighbours are struggling to put food on the table. I want to tell you about an amazing food rescue program in my riding of Windsor Tecumseh. It's called Plentiful Harvest, and it's operated by the Unemployed Help Centre. Since 2012, this program has built over 50 ongoing relationships with local farmers, greenhouse operators, food distributors, and banquet hall managers in Windsor and Essex County. The program has rescued more than four million pounds of food for the needy. Speaker, this is fresh, nutritious food, mostly produce, like peppers, corn, tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchini, melons, peaches, and apples, but surplus food from restaurants and banquet halls is also collected. Under the supervision of certified chefs, students who otherwise may have dropped out of school are taught kitchen skills. They prepare the food, create delicious meals, and take great pride in doing so. Meals are packed and distributed to those most in need through a network of local food banks and community agencies. Congratulations to the students, the farmers and the volunteers, and for the special thanks to the hard work of Chef Robert Catherine and Manager Mike Turnbull at the Unemployed Help Centre, a salute from all of us here in the Ontario Legislature for a job well done and for setting an example for all of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member from Ottawa, Orleans. Mr. President, let me start by Mr. Speaker, uh, for Jim Watson on his uh, re-election, and also my city councillors of Ottawa, Orleans, Stephen Blair, Bob Monette, and Tim Turney on their re-election. Also, we have a newcomer, uh, Mr. Councillor Jody Mittick for Innisword, and Mr. Mittick will be replacing long-standing councillor Rainer Blows, who has decided to retire after 20 years serving his community. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday. I dedicated a few hours of my time to help celebrate Orleans at the all-day event Experience Orléans, organized by the Orleans Chamber of Commerce at the Shankman Center. The main purpose of that gathering of residents and businesses people has been to bring awareness in the possibilities Orleans has to offer. I was also very happy to see Employment Ontario as a sponsor promoting our government's program with businesses and successfully hosting a job fair. More than 25 employers were on site looking to hire people. This free event, very well attended, gave our community of Ottawa Orleans the chance to discover the business where they live, work, and stay. J'aimerais donc remercier devant cette chambre. To thank before the assembly the Chamber of Commerce, Jenny Kwong, the President, the Chair Donna Roney, and Jason Belfler, who helped with the coordination of volunteers. Appartenance à la merveilleuse communauté d'Ottawa Orléans. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last Friday, I had the occasion to attend the annual Warden's Banquet in Renfrew County. The big event of the evening, however, was something more important. 
a tribute to Jack Wilson. Jack Wilson was first elected to the council of the former Pembroke Township in 1963. He announced this year that he would not seek re-election as the mayor of Laurentian Valley, over 50 consecutive years in elected office, something that has been accomplished by very few and something, I dare say, is unlikely to be accomplished in the future. Jack's 50-plus years was made possible because of who he is, the principles by which he's conducted himself, and the way he's treated others. I've had the pleasure and the honour of experiencing that firsthand over the past 11 years. Jack's word is his bond. You can take it to the bank. If he doesn't agree with you, he'll tell you so, and he'll tell you why. He's a legend in municipal politics, and anyone who has sat alongside him would enthusiastically agree. Jack would be the first to say that he didn't accomplish this alone, that his 58-year partnership with his good wife, Evelyn, was paramount. The support of Evelyn and their children made all those sacrifices easier to bear. When Jack does leave public life, I'm convinced that his commitment to his community, be, community will be as strong as ever. Jack Wilson won't be going away. I'm sure that in the future, my path will continue to cross with his. Whenever that does happen, I will be proud to shake his hand and share our thoughts on whatever the story of the day might be. All the best, my friend. You have served your people well. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I extend my gratitude to the members of this House for their unanimous support of my private member's motion asking for a national inquiry on missing and murdered Aboriginal women. What happened in this chamber last Thursday is a powerful message. This House's impromptu recognition and celebration of the Aboriginal women who came to the Legislature as witnesses to the occasion was also significant. Your actions were emblematic of the real will that exists and continues to grow in this country to right the injustices and the generations of suffering of Aboriginal women and girls. I was, however, disappointed to learn that a member of this House informed my guests in the gallery that the motion was meaningless, a waste of time, and would never result in action. Last Thursday was a bright day amongst many dark ones for these women. It was not the time for such comments. I hope I will never hold such a low opinion of our work in this House. Like the Premier, I believe the government can be a force for good, and we need to continue to work together on this issue. Miigwech. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On Saturday, October 18th, a very much storied shrine located in my riding of Beaches, East York, celebrated its 60th anniversary. The Ted Reeve Community Arena came to be thanks to the initiative of a number of local residents who felt it was time for an indoor arena in East York. The community raised over $125,000. With the, and with the City of Toronto matching those funds, Ted Reeve Community Arena was born with the support of Ted Reeve, who is a local telegram sports writer and a professional athlete. Ted Reeve won two great cups with the Balmy Beach Club and was a, was a project's biggest champion. Bob Acton, a 50-year veteran of the Toronto Ted Reeves Community Arena, he dropped the puck for the ceremonial face-off, which is now also the home for the Malvern Black Knights. Some of the kids who came and played there have grown up to be professionals. We have Al Sims, who played for the Kings, Shane and Toski, John Smirk, who played for the Blues, Nick Beverly, who played for Boston, LA Kings, and also briefly head up the Toronto Maple Leafs, and also Rich Kloon, who now plays for the National Predators. Ted Reeve Arena is a great example of a community facility that makes Beaches East York special, and I'm delighted to be able to honour it here today. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements.